My name is Joe Peroni, and this is the Rise Above Project. I've been a personal trainer for about 35 years, and currently I am also a marriage and family therapist. And with that, I'm going to use some of that knowledge for our show today. Today, I want to talk about uh, Wendy O. Williams and maybe some life lessons that we can learn, you know, from her life and unfortunately her death. Let's start right at the top. Wendy O. Williams was a singer for the Plasmatics, and she also had a solo career. She was from uh, Webster, New York, which from what I hear is about 10 to 15 miles away from Rochester, New York. And she was inducted into the Rochester Hall of Fame in 2016. Wendy was born in 1948. Unfortunately, she died of a uh, self-inflicted gunshot wound, wound on uh, April 6th, 1998, which is about uh, 24 years ago. I think the anniversary of that was just about uh, eight days ago. And she was 48 years old at the time. And if this did not happen, uh, she would be, if you can believe this, 72 years old right now. She was survived by Rod Swenson, who is her... The, uh, the manager of the Plasmatics, but it was also her life partner for about uh, 23 years, I think it is. So why am I doing this show? Uh, number one, I think there's some lessons to be learned here, number one. But also, you know, back to 1998, her suicide, it's bothered me for a lot of years and it's bothered me for a lot of reasons. And so that's why I'm going to do this show today. She uh, was an extremely unique individual who tried to inspire people. And when I say the word try, I mean try, because I really do think that she lived a life where she was definitely trying to inspire people. But unfortunately, I think somewhere along the line, it didn't necessarily happen and she didn't get the... Uh, all of the, the just do that she should have for all the things that she was trying to do in life. And I think that's one of the things that bothers me. Uh, she was definitely ahead of her time. She was a very intelligent person, but more than that, she had a very high degree of emotional intelligence. She was empathetic, she was compassionate. She tried to help people to challenge the status quo. And I think therefore, she ended up being very much misunderstood uh, marginalized, and again, I don't think she ever got the credit in her life that, that she should have. And also now as a marriage and family therapist, it's, uh, it's a little worrisome for me because in terms of uh, depression and suicide, I believe Wendy did all the right things. She worked out all the time. She spent a lot of time being diligent with her nutrition, and she definitely had meaning and purpose in her life. But although all of that was there, it wasn't enough for her to succumb to her depression. When I think about this, I think about in terms of, I heard that she never really got along, you know, where she lived. She felt out of place. She never really felt... Uh, loved and cared about by her parents. She just didn't connect. So I could say she had an invalidating childhood. But as she got older, I think we could also say that the world for her was pretty much invalidating. And I think that was part of the reason why her life ended up the way it did. I can also say that when you have a lot of intelligence about the world and you're very insightful, I think there's a level of existential depression that a lot of people have that have that background like Wendy had. All that as it may. The thing that I remember most about Wendy O. Williams is that I actually had a, a relatively lengthy conversation with her back in 1985. And I think that's probably what I remember the most. It was at a, uh, an in-store appearance at a place called Slip Disc. It was in Valley Stream, Long Island. 
And if I remember right, again, I think it was 1985, which means that I was a 20 year old, incredibly shy, inhibited, uh, introverted. And she was about probably about 36 to 37 years old at that time, very intimidating, at least for me at that time. I was a little nervous to meet her. So I went there with the album in hand, like everybody else did because it was an in-store appearance. And it was kind of interesting because the type of people that showed up there, as I'm looking back on it, I didn't see too many girls. There were no young girls. I mean, there might've been, but I just don't remember that. But what I remember is just like a lot of very young, horny guys, right? Because she had a certain look, she dressed a certain way. And that's the type of crowd that she had. So I was in that crowd by myself and I did have the album. And it was really interesting because I went up to her and I didn't want to be like all the other guys. Now, I, from what I remember, Wendy Williams was very happy to be there and she was signing and doing all the things that she does. But it was kind of like the same thing over and over again. It was boring. Like one other guy just still wanted her to sign her breasts, you know, on the, the picture of her breasts on the album cover, things like that. And she had bodyguards on, on each side of the table. Uh, probably more than one on each side. I, I kind of forgot that, but they were intimidating and they would move you right along, quick sign and out you go, out you go, out you go, because there's a lot of people. When I got up there, I showed her a magazine and I opened it up and I said, is that you? And the thing that made it different was, is that it was a bodybuilding magazine from before her career in the plasmatics. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, she lights up. She has this big smile on her face. And she goes, wow, you remember that? That's how you know me? <laughs> and I laughed. I said, yeah, I'm, I've done a lot of bodybuilding shows. It's my thing. I still remember this. And I still have that magazine. And I like your music. But I have the magazine open. And I have it in my room. And it's there for me to see all the time. And she started talking about how fun it was. And we started to get into this thing about working out. And she started talking about, you know, doing deadlifts so she can deadlift like 315 pounds. And we started to talk. Well, of course, the bodyguards were none too happy because there was a lot of young boys, men, whatever, waiting in line. And they were like, come on, come on, come on, you know, move it right along. The guy goes to grab me. And here was one of the best parts. Wendy says, no, 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 he's with me. And she directed me to sit on the, not sit, I actually stood on the side of the table that she was at. And I proceeded to have, a, like I said, it, was, it seemed, I don't know, I mean, 20 to 30 minute conversation with her while she was doing the signing. And although that doesn't seem like a lot of time for anybody listening to this, when you, she's at a two hour signing with hundreds of people showing up, that's a long time for one guy, one young 20 year old boy to be standing there talking to her. We started to talk about nutrition and we started to get into that a little bit. And that was interesting too. I was just so surprised that she actually wanted to have a real conversation and it wasn't just, oh yeah, good. You showed your breast, you know, <laughs> like it, the conversation was deeper than that. So from there, I said something really stupid. I said something like, are you, are you interested in competing in bodybuilding shows anymore? And that's when she smiled and she kind of laughed a little bit. And she says, well, you do know that I'm a, a musician now, right? <laughs> and it was just so funny. I was like, uh, yeah, <laughs> but you know, I figured you can do both if that's your thing. If you know, that would set you apart, not like you need it, <laughs> but you know, you know, why put an interest away if you don't have to? And anyway, it was a good conversation. But the biggest part that I take away from it is that I don't know why I had a 20-year-old brain at the time. I wasn't very smart or I didn't have a lot of wisdom. And this was before my therapy career. But I did have this feeling about her. So I asked her a question. I said, what does it feel like not to have any peers? And she looked at me, she said, well, I don't understand. What do you mean? I said, well, I said, you're into punk rock in heavy metal, which is basically a man's business. And you are obviously female. That's, you don't have a lot of peers there. 
And when you're trying to be empowering to women, women are kind of turned off by the whole look of the thing and sometimes the sound of it. So you're kind of alone. And I said, you're in a business that's all about maybe sex, drugs, and rock and roll while you are basically a fitness enthusiast in the middle of this. And so everything you do, you're kind of like the only one doing it at the time. And she, li she listened to that and she said, yeah, you're kind of right. Um, I have people on this side and people on this side, but I don't have a lot of emotional connection or connection to a person that sees and hears me for all of me and what I do. And I didn't take it any further than that because, again, I was a dumb 20-year-old boy. And But I got to tell you, though, uh, that was, again, 1985-ish, I believe. I moved from Long Island to Las Vegas in 1990. And then when I heard that she had commit, committed suicide in 1998, I really went back to that conversation of, did this woman actually feel emotionally connected to other human beings or to the world? And I really went back to that with that conversation because in my mind, you know, I wish the world back then was kind of the way it is now. Like right now, everybody thinks they're a therapist, right? We're all therapized, so to speak. Like everybody uses the words. They use the word narcissism, gaslighting, whatever it is. We all know therapy now. Even though I am a therapist, everybody else thinks that they're a therapist, even though that they're not. But back then, if we had a little bit more awareness about therapy and mental health and existential depression, I really think that things would have been different. And I think this is one of the things that just kind of bothers me. Some other things that I think about when I think about Wendy. She... Uh, <laughs> she stood for things. She cared about things. And she was so far ahead of her time that she ended up getting thrown off of shows. Nobody wanted to talk to her. And again, she never connected to people. So some of the things that she stood for, I just made a little bit of a list. Self-expression, self-improvement, self-empowerment, obviously exercise. Uh, she worked out a lot with weights, uh, which is, again, very forward thinking for, for women at that time. She swam. Uh, every, I've got a, she, I think she, she was into martial arts too. I believe she was a black belt in karate. Uh, she definitely talked about healthy sexuality, which I think is very important. It's very interesting. I think we talk a big game, right? And, and women do too. I'm not a woman, so I shouldn't say too much because I don't have any clout as a woman, obviously. But I hear women talk about healthy sexuality, that if a man is attractive and he you know is has a degree of success and he has access to women why, why why shouldn't he partake in that you know sex is one of the 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 most beautiful things and the best thing we can feel right so why wouldn't a man partake in that well th but the thing is the tables are turned though when it's a woman right like a woman successful she's caring she's this she's successful and maybe she wants to involve herself in in sex all of a sudden uh oh we have bad names for girls who are like that and she was not that way. She was like, well, listen, you're only an object if you want to be an object, okay? You can be the subject, <laughs> you know? So this whole thing about women today talking about being authentic and having healthy sexuality, and you take over your, your own empowerment. I think they're addicted to talking about empowerment, but I don't see a lot of it, you know, because women are still putting other women down for being themselves. So I don't know why they do that. Again, she talked about eating healthy. She talked about uh, simple sugars. She talked about refined sugars. She talked about hydrogenated oils. She actually talked about this like in her interviews and people interviewing her were like with a blank stare. They have no idea what she was talking about. Uh, she was a vegetarian. At some point in her life, she was a macrobiotic cook. And the other thing that was interesting, too, is that she rehabbed animals, which, again, that goes back to your uh, compassion and empathy. In terms of other things, she talked about corruption in government, which, of course, that's always been there, though, right? But even more so today. She talked about police brutality, which, again, that's up to our subjects today. I talked about sexism, anti-consumerism, anti-fake people, nonconformity, questioning our authority, being yourself. And again, about 40 years ahead of her time, talking about global climate change, uh, the radiation of foods, 
being fully authentic and setting your own style. Over and over again, she was way ahead of her time. I said, uh, I don't know if you could find it on YouTube anymore, but there was a show where she got basically thrown off the show because she was on there with the Mrs. Fields or whoever. I mean, Miss, Mrs. Fields Cookies. I'm assuming the person who made it, her name is Mrs. Fields too. I don't know. But she basically compared her to a person uh, selling heroin because the, the poisons in those cookies, the sugars, the high fructose corn syrup, made to addict people and you're giving these cookies to young children right so she put that as the same thing as being a drug dealer and here's the truth she was right but the fact is that people can't hear it they don't want to hear it so i don't even care if people like her music or not because that's a very specific taste you know maybe people don't like that real hard rock style i get that but what she stood for was much more than that and you know what, I'm gonna play, if I can do this real quick. I'm gonna see if I could uh, play this video real quick. It's all uh, real short. Um, she's gonna talk about um, a sh uh, strong women. So let's see if I can play this. And for some reason I can't get it right now, but that's okay, we'll, we'll skip past that. She was talking about that she likes to be a strong woman. She thinks women should work out and she thinks that women should be who they want to be and not who society wants them to be. I think it's a great message. The only problem with that, at least from my point of view, is that while she was talking about all that and being authentic, being a trendsetter, she was getting beat up, let's say, in Milwaukee on obscenity charges by like eight different policemen were punching her into unconsciousness and breaking her nose. She was not selling many albums, even though there was a Kiss album basically out that ever, the guys in Kiss played the music, she sang. And even that album didn't do incredibly well. So while she's not being treated well, give or take a few years and somewhere around the same time, you're looking at Madonna on stage at the Grammys doing a whole masturbation scene and getting famous and getting an award. Whereas when Wendy did that, she got her face beat up. <laughs> like, I don't understand that. You know, you look at people like Joan Jett who had a great career, but basically was ripping off Wendy O. Williams right from the beginning. And you want to talk about authenticity, how authentic is Joan Jett? Because when they asked her about her sexuality throughout her 40-year career, she's always been extremely ambiguous, which is fine. You don't need to tell people about your sexuality, but is she authentic? Because the reason why she didn't want to tell everybody she was a lesbian is because she didn't want to cut her fans in half, right? Whether it's straight male or heterosexual women. So she made it very ambiguous for a reason because she cared more about making money in her career than being authentic. And again, I like Joan Jett, you know, but that's beside the point. We can have another discussion about is being authentic a, a good thing or not in terms of finances, right? Uh, look, let's look at Cher. Cher made a career off of wearing risque things. Wendy Williams did it and got basically destroyed and pushed, pushed out to pasture. I'm not understanding that. Let me look at this real quick, if I can find it real quick for you. So just so we know what we're talking about, this is Cher, and this is what she wore on stage. Okay? If you're wearing that and you're Cher and you become multi-zillionaire and famous and all you know, women and men are looking at you going, yeah, you go, you're an empowered woman. How, I wanna know how come in the way this world works that Wendy O. Williams did that even before that or during that time period and she's looked at as a pariah. I don't understand that. Again, that makes no sense. Let's take a look at somebody like the Divinals. Their lead singer, 
obviously a woman, had their big hit song, When I Think About You, I Touch Myself. So again, we're going back to the masturbation thing where when Yale Williams gets you know, destroyed for talking about things like that, and yet the Divinals have a huge hit song in the early 90s. I don't understand that. We can go on and on and on. I mean, by today's standard, you got, what, Jennifer Lopez, Miley Cyrus, uh, Cardi B. Like, all of these people get popular based on their sexuality. And Wendy O. Williams does it, and everybody goes, oh, my God, no. I, I, it's really hard to figure out. I just don't know that. So here's a question, right? Is it possible to be too authentic? Maybe it is. Because the people that I mentioned... Also, they ride that line because they get popular with women because they're somewhat glamorous as well. And, I, and they are still working through the corporate means. Whereas Wendy Williams did not do that. So she was talking about true authenticity. And the people that she was trying to get to be more authentic and to be more empowered were women. And women basically turned their backs on her. So I think that's one of the things, another one of the things that really bothered me a lot. Let's talk a little bit more about this in terms of uh, therapy. In terms of therapy, again, the need to be authentic now is being pushed by every therapist and every self-help coach that I can think of. But empirical evidence tells us that if you're going to be fully authentic, you're not going to have as many friends, you're not going to make as much money, and you're probably going to have some weird relationships with your family as well. You just have to know that. I'm not saying don't be authentic, but you have to know that. And I think in terms of Wendy O. Williams, it's a cautionary tale about being fully authentic is this is a situation that can happen to you. Also in therapy, we talk about that you should not need external validation, except the fact that that's not true. Human beings are born with the, with the it's a necessity to attach to your caregivers. And as we get older, we still have that need to attach to caregivers and other people. The world is our mirror. So in other words, if people seem not to like you, they seem to be distant from you, they don't really validate you, you look at that and say, well, I must not be a good person. Something must be wrong. And even if you're old enough at the time, let's say like Wendy O. Williams was at some point to say, this is who I am, this is my life, and this is what I want to do, but the world is basically turning their back on me, and your ideas are dying of loneliness, it does create a disconnect. It does create an attachment injury. Because as human beings, we all need to connect. So I don't care how tough and strong you think you are saying, it's my life and I'll do what I want. Yeah, but if you do it and you're alone, especially if you're an artist, I think we're really dropping the ball as mental health clinicians to tell people, listen, you don't need external validation. It doesn't matter because that's not true. Human beings do. And I think that's the crux of the issues that we need to talk to people about that is that you can't be run by external validation. Absolutely not. But it's still a very important part of life. And it should be very well understood that if people are doing their best to be who they are and who they want to be. And they're looking at the world as their mirror. And the mirror says, listen, you're not going to sell many albums. Even the girls you're trying to empower are turning their back on you. Uh, the men who like you, most of them are just horny guys. Like you're not really getting to, your message is not getting out appropriately. And it's got to be extremely hurtful. So I think that's an important part to deal with. The other part is that what about people in this world that have an incredible amount of empathy, an incredible amount of compassion, and they have a lot of insight? You know, you could walk into a store and most people just go in there and the average person now is, is just completely overweight with no goals in their life. What if you're a person like Wendy O. Williams and you know that half the food or more than half the food in there is not food, it's poison and it's garbage. And what happens is that just giving it to the masses to make them fatter and to make them need more medications and drugs as they get older. So big pharma is getting millions upon maybe billions in terms of profits. 
and they're selling cheap food to people that don't know any better. And the fact is, is that when they do know better, they don't care. The number one food in America right now is white bread. It's disgusting. So if you're a person like Wendy O. Williams who knows this, and you have great insight into people and to what's going on in the world, it does have a tendency to make you depressed. And like she says, she had a lot of difficulty with human beings. <laughs> yeah, I get it. <clears throat> Especially when you are you say something and you put a message out there and they don't understand it. They don't have the intellectual capacity. They don't have the emotional capacity to understand it. And so again, your ideas die of loneliness and there you sit by yourself. And it's really, you, you sit like her where you just end up rehabbing animals and on the day that she killed herself, she was feeding birds and squirrels. Totally sad, totally sad. I wanna read her suicide note because <clears throat> I think it's important. And then I'll finish the show in just a second. Here's her suicide note. I don't believe that people should take their own lives without deep and thoughtful reflection over a considerable period of time. I do believe strongly, however, that the right to do so is one of the most fundamental rights that anyone in a free society should have. For me, much of the world makes no sense, but my feelings about what I am doing ring loud and clear to an inner ear and a place where there is no self, only calm. That's from her, that's the last thing she wrote. What I wanna add here, uh, whether someone's religious or not, don't care. I'm not that religious myself, but I think this rings true. When I, when I look at the psychology of Wendy O. Williams and what we could learn from her. Ecclesiastes uh, one eighteen. For in much wisdom is much grief. And he that increaseth knowledge will also increaseth their sorrow. I believe that to be true. I believed that's what Wendy L. Williams was going through. And I do believe still to this day that uh, going along with the conversation that I had with her and what I've learned since, it's really heartbreaking the way this world treated her. She lived in, inv in a uh, invalidating world, as far as I can see. And yeah, they said that she died from a single, uh, a gunshot wound to the head. And by the way, she put a mask, uh, a bag over her head so her life partner didn't have to see her that way. So even then she was still caring about other people. I don't think she died from a bullet to the head. I think she died from a broken heart, from a world that just is not ready to accept certain types of people in this world. It's unfortunate, though, because she did have a life partner, Rod Swenson, and although I'm going to take my best guess and say that he validated her for sure, but sometimes, you know, one person is not enough. Uh, we live in a world where there's a lot of people and we have a lot of connections and we do want to know that our life means something and that we can make a difference in the world. And when we watch other people that have way less talent, way less authenticity, uh, way le they work a lot less than us and they seem to reap the rewards of millions of dollars, uh, having great legacies and this could be heartbreaking for some people. So that's my uh, tribute to Wendy O. Williams' life lessons. My name is Joe Peroni. This is the Rise Above Project. If you found any of this uh, valuable, please subscribe and tell a friend. Thank you.